Good evening, Cupcakes. It is a beautiful day here in Zephyr Town. I hope your day is going wonderfully. You might have noticed something a little different going on today. That's right. Just in case you weren't paying attention to the title of this video, we are finally doing the Grand Bazaar Husband Overview today. Strap yourselves in because, oh boy, is this going to be a long one. Not only did you guys get far beyond the light goal for the waifu review, but frankly, not completely ignorant of the gender divide of my viewing audience. I know you've all been waiting for a long time for this, and I appreciate your patience. That said, I've kind of been dreading making this video. While I'm not exactly an expert on husbandos for reasons, that's not why. There are a few topics we need to discuss that inform my rankings of Amir, Angelo, and Ivan. These are not popular topics, and so delving into them is sure to earn me some hatred. But before we get into that, I want to explain how the tier list works. At the bottom is the Scrap Metal tier. This is for marriage candidates that, if you husband or wife with them, I'll be calling the FBI on you. Do not husband or waifu under any circumstances. Next is the copper tier. This is for husbandos and waifus that you should probably avoid. They all have huge flaws that could lead to a very unhappy life. That said, the majority of the marriage candidates that fit into the copper tier are unfit only for the majority. There are many that would not consider their flaws to be a big deal, or even consider their flaws to actually be positive traits. After that is the silver tier. These are your average waifus and husbandos. These are perfectly suitable marriage material for most, and ideal for many. Certainly ideal for more than the copper tiers are for. But most will find greener pastures elsewhere. And those greener pastures would be the one in each review that takes the gold. This is reserved for the best husbando or waifu in a particular game. And that's it. Those are all the tiers that exist, and there are definitely no others. While we are doing this husbando review in a particular order, it's not an alphabetical one. The order in which we're doing this starts with Dirk. And I do have to apologize. I really did try to give Dirk a better rating, largely because he won the Japan-only popularity poll, beating out his brother by one point. I thought maybe my perception of him as a childish character was off, that there was something I was missing, or something in his heart events that betrayed some hidden maturity. But no, it's actually even worse than I thought. Dirk is a child through and through. His best friend is Kevin, for goodness sake. So why did he top the popularity poll? Well, like I said, it was Japan only, and Japan also thought that Daisy and Potpourri were acceptable marriage candidates. So there's that. Basically, Dirk is the male Chris Hansen bait in this game. Scrap metal tier. The good news is that he's much more mature in Tale of Two Towns, but that's for another video and we'll be discussing his many positive traits in that video. Next up is Angelo. Angelo is an artiste. I know that gives him a free pass into the top tier for some, including every married woman in Zephyrtown, apparently, but hear me out for a bit. And if you're an artist yourself, well, be patient and try to be understanding because you might be prone to take offense at what I'm going to explain. In biology, there is a concept known as R versus K selection. This describes the spectrum of child-rearing strategies, from a species that births dozens to hundreds or even thousands of young with little investment in raising them, R selection, versus a species that does not have many children but invests heavily into them. The standard comparison is rabbits versus wolves, though they're both mammals that give birth to litters, so it's a little closer to the middle for both of those. Humans are the most case-selected species on the planet. In fact, it's one of the pillars of our success as a species. 
Even so, evolution creates averages and bell curves, not absolutes. Furthermore, R versus K selection is more relative than absolute. It's like smooth versus rough, or dark versus light, or short versus tall. Something that is off-white is darker than white, and something that is navy blue is lighter than black. For our purposes, R selected and K selected are relative to the average for humans. There are many traits that are indicative of R selection and others that are indicative of K selection. If someone has a lot of R selected traits, that person is likely to have a good amount of the rest of the R selected traits. From the fact that R selected individuals have historically tended to have more children with lower reproductive success rates than K selected individuals, you might think that it's those that want to have children that are R selected. This is not the case. A desire for children is actually a K-selected trait. The reason why R-selected individuals have had more children throughout history is because of a trick of evolution that gives them the trait of not processing consequences very well, if you get my meaning. As an aside, R-selection is dying out in recent decades thanks to advancements in birth control. For the first time in human history, K-selected individuals are out-reproducing R-selected individuals. In spite of how common it is in the modern day for K-selected individuals to have doubts about their own abilities in raising children. If you're having those doubts, well, that's an indicator that you're K-selected and would therefore make a far better parent than many that I've seen. But I digress. The point I'm trying to explain is that the not processing of consequences very well, as well as related traits that we, as a K-selected species, consider to be immoral or unethical, means that our selected individuals tend to be very difficult to have a relationship with. It can be trying in the best of times for most, but not all. Why is this relevant, though? Well, one of the few things we know about Angelo is that he's an artist. In fact, his character centers around it. Almost every conversation and event with him relates to that in some way. And artistic tendencies is an R-selected trait. This is one of the main reasons why the relationships of actors or musicians tend to be so troubled. Most in these artistic fields are R-selected. You'll note, however, that I said most. A single R-selected trait, even one as significant as artistic tendencies, is not proof of overall R-selection, nor would overall R-selection even then be proof of these traits that make relationships with R-selected individuals so difficult. That also applies to all the artists watching this right now, by the way. Hi. Angelo has, however, displayed R-selected traits other than just artistic ability. His pettiness, an R-selected trait, and lack of considering the consequences, such as Dirk returning the favor, are on display in the Dirk's arrogance random event. And in his Blue Heart event, we learn that he isn't good with children, though that could be blamed on his youth instead of R-selection. And while the Ladies' Man random event is mostly about the unwanted attention that Angelo gets from the women of Zephyrtown, it does imply that he has plenty of stories of attention women have given him that he did want, if you catch my meaning, that he can share, else the women of Zephyrtown likely won't be trying to pry. The point is that Angelo is a gambler's husband -o. It's a risk. Of course, that's assuming that you mind those are selected traits. Some don't, and some even consider them to be a positive. If that's the case, then he probably rates higher for you. For the purpose of this list, however, he has to go in the copper tier. One thing I'll note before we move on. If you're in favor of a husbando that you can create headcanons for, Angelo is probably the best choice. He has the most left unsaid about him. Talk about why I'm placing Amir where I am. First, we should go back over 1,800 years to the decline and eventual fall of the Han Dynasty, a time known as the Three Kingdoms Period. 
Liu Biao, a name I'm sure I'm butchering, was one of the last emperors of the Han Dynasty, but his rule was short-lived. Just a few months after his father died and he had inherited the throne, Dong Zhuo, a warlord who had taken control of the capital, had him removed from power in favor of the emperor's younger brother. Only a few months after that, when a coalition was formed against Dong Zhuo's corrupt puppeting of the new emperor, the warlord sent one of his officials to the former emperor's residence to force him to drink poisoned wine. Yao spoke to his wife one last time, telling her to always remember that she had been the wife of an emperor, and to never let herself be married off to a lesser lord. He then drank the wine and died. He was 14 at the time. During the Three Kingdoms period, many who sought power would be killed young, and while Biao was far from the youngest, he was the youngest that I'll name. Dong Zhuo would later be assassinated, and his entire family executed. I could go on for hours about various individuals, some of my favorite figures from this period, that sought power and met a bad end during the Thirty Kingdoms period. And there were so many others whose names were lost to history because their pursuit of power was cut short too soon for their names to be remembered. It seems odd that I would have to explain this in a world where Game of Thrones was so popular, but the pursuit of power, fame, and fortune is dangerous. It's about as dangerous as jumping off a cliff and hoping you'll either learn to fly or that vegetation will break your fall just enough so that you'll only break some bones. And it's not just political power either. How many entrepreneurs have lost everything on a bad investment? How many musicians have died penniless on the streets? How many YouTubers have invested thousands of hours of their lives recording and editing videos with nothing to show for it? As a general rule, people don't jump off cliffs hoping to fly. Everyone that did died out long before anything remotely human walked the earth, and so their genes were never passed on. How is it, then, that people still pursue power, fame, and fortune? How is it that the desire for such things has not been removed from our collective genetic lineage? Well, as Game of Thrones taught many the dangers of pursuing power, so too did it teach us why the desire for it has not died out. Simply put, pursuing power is a risk with plenty of reproductive reward should one succeed. To return to the Third Kingdom's period, Cao Cao, who succeeded in gaining control of the new emperor not long after those events mentioned previously, had over 30 children. And those were just his true-born children. There's no telling how many other children he had that were not documented as his. This aside is important to understand, but is also one of the issues I've been hesitant to discuss. This very risk-reward system is why, no matter how many multi-billion dollar international campaigns push the issue, no matter how many regulations revolve around this issue, no matter how much social pressure is hammered into them, women will not reach anywhere near half the politicians, CEOs, scientists, etc. For women, the pursuit of power is all risk and no reward. Worse, the time it takes to pursue power and the sacrifices of one's personal life that must occur means that the mere pursuit of power, successful or not, will result in reproductive punishment, both due to lost fertility as well as the stresses and demands of power. And that social pressure and those multi-billion dollar campaigns I was talking about, they're removing women that have any innate desire for power, as well as women that are susceptible to such social pressures from the gene pool at a shockingly fast rate, to the point where women will make up fewer of those positions with each generation. And that's not even going into the lost of their lineage of parenting habits due to the aforementioned demands of power. The point is that the reason why this innate desire for power is so much rarer in women than in men is because of this lack of reproductive reward for such a massive risk. If evolution determines that a particular trait is beneficial to one sex, but damaging to the other, 
then it will tie that trait either to the chromosome directly or, more likely, the expression of that trait will be activated by hormones. This is why those in positions of power, fame, and fortune have higher testosterone than normal. The body essentially performs a calculation with two variables, one's inherited desire for power alongside the body's perceived testosterone levels. And that determines how much of a psychological reward one receives for pursuing power versus rejecting this pursuit. Even those women that are outliers in their desire for power tend to have higher testosterone levels than the average woman, and are usually more sensitive to that testosterone as well. But how does all this relate to Amir? Well, as mentioned before, risk without reward tends to result in genetic destruction. Those that took the risk, but were unwilling to reap the rewards, as it were, did not last long in the genetic pool. As a result, this means that those with a strong inherent desire for power, fame, and fortune tend to have a much weaker inherent desire for monogamy than is normal. And throughout history, monogamy among the wealthy and powerful was actually quite rare. Outside of Greco-Roman culture and its influences on Christianity, officially monogamous marriages amongst those in positions of power and wealth were the exception, not the rule. And within Greco-Roman and Christian cultures, those officially monogamous marriages were almost always unofficially not monogamous. To be clear, this is not to say that monogamy is unnatural for humans. Quite the opposite. The vast majority of men and women prefer monogamy. But a desire for power, fame, and fortune is found alongside a desire to set aside monogamy in one's own life, because those that did not tie the two together pursued risk with little reward. This relates to Amir because one of his ancestors pursued that risk, and therefore likely pursued a reproductive reward. The point is that, for all the romance around princes, the reality is that the vast majority of them make less than ideal husbandos. Even though he's only 21st in line for the throne, it's not unlikely that he inherited this royal trait. But one point that we've touched on before, often ignored by those who take offense to the very nature of evolution, is that evolution does not create absolutes. Evolution can be said to understand that circumstances change. And so it takes many generations for even the most disadvantageous trait to be completely removed from the gene pool of even small groups. Those in power are no exception to this, which means that exceptions exist among them. While the rule for the ruling class may be unfaithfulness, there are exceptions to that rule. Based on everything we know about him, it is a good bet that Amir would be one of those exceptions, whether due to a genetic disinclination towards this royal trait, or due to high levels of self-control. But there is always a risk to it. That said, even aside from his individual charm, he does have one other thing working in his favor. The reason why princes are so romanticized is because, while the pursuit of power is risk without reward for women, the pursuit of powerful partners is reproductive reward without reproductive risk. As Henry Kissinger once said, power is the ultimate aphrodisiac. And even if Amir was not as individually charming as he is, even if he wasn't likely an exception to the men in power rule, then he would still have points in his favor simply for that. So, how do we balance these out? Well, Amir, like Angelo, is a bit of a gambler's husband though. There's a good chance that he'd be the perfect husband o in every way. But there's also a risk that he'll end up as an unfaithful husband o He may even hate himself for it, but if he inherited that royal trait and lacks the strength of will to control it, then he would still be unfaithful. However, there is far more potential upside with Amir, and based on what we know about him, he seems less likely to have that royal trait 
Or, if he does, he's likely to try and keep it under control. Ergo, we will be placing him in the silver tier. That said, I am fully aware that there are women who do not mind such things. That would be the female version of the royal trait, since women pursuing men in power would have to have been okay with their habits. For these women, Amir is unquestionably gold tier. And, since I am cursed with the knowledge that some women even view the royal trait as a positive, I have decided to curse you with this knowledge as well. For those women, he probably ranks even higher. Alright, is everyone sufficiently offended? If not, we've got plenty of opportunity with this next one, because we're moving on to Ivan. Ivan is an unfortunate one to discuss. On paper, he seems like the perfect husband though. He's intelligent, well-read, polite, and has a lot of experience with children, both from his job as a teacher as well as largely raising his younger brother himself. And while his job as a teacher does take up a good portion of his time, he can and does always make time for the loved ones in his life. Yet, there's a common complaint about Ivan as a husband though. It's impossible to talk about Ivan as a husband though and not come across people talking about the fact that as a husband though, he's boring. If you watched my waifu review, you'll know that I don't consider this a valid complaint for waifus. On the other hand, for husbandos, this is actually a very valid complaint. The optimal reproductive strategy is somewhat limiting for both men and women, but in different ways. Men have a lot of freedom in life choices that can be considered within the range of optimal reproductive strategy, yet not a lot of freedom in choice of traits in romantic partners, hence why the boring pick for waifus is far and away the best. If you take this understanding and consider the consequences of it, women would naturally be mirrored in this aspect. While women's optimal reproductive strategy is limiting as far as life choices go, women have a lot of freedom in choice of traits in a romantic partner while still meeting the standard of optimal reproductive strategy. Optimal reproductive strategy is important to consider even for those that are not interested in the reproductive aspect of it, because our emotions are supposed to be a guide. Those that were happy following less successful reproductive strategies tended to not reproduce as successfully, which means that their genes got crowded out by those whose emotions guided them to optimal reproductive strategy. The reason it's important is because we can reverse it. Instead of finding optimal reproductive strategy through what makes us truly happy, rather than just dulling the pain of an unhappy life, we can seek happiness with optimal reproductive strategy as our guide. We can use reason to find happiness. As stated before, evolution does not create absolutes. Optimal reproductive strategy changes by the day, and none of us are seeking exactly optimal reproductive strategy, but the vast majority are seeking something close. And so using that as our starting point will put us miles ahead in terms of seeking happiness. Back to Ivan. None of this should be construed to say that Ivan is a bad husbando. Far from it. Ivan is a perfectly serviceable husbando. But the point is that him being a boring choice is a much more valid complaint than Sherry being a boring choice for waifu. In the end, he's kind of like the opposite of Amir. Perfectly safe and reasonable without a lot of risk or reward either way. But, just like Amir, he goes into the silver tier. The fifth character in my waifu review was the secretly top tier unmarriageable waifu. You may be wondering, is there a secretly top tier yet unmarriageable husbando in this game? Yes. Yes there is. And no, it's not Raul. Jerry's dad is actually pretty rad. He's all I want 
And I'm obsessed just a tad Sherry, can't you see? Your dad's just the guy for me I know it might be bad But I'm in love with Sherry's dad <clears throat> Okay, just for the record So we're all clear on this That's just a song I'm not actually in love with Felix My viewers, on the other hand, well... Whenever I put Felix in the thumbnail of a video, I can pretty much guarantee that the video will do quite well. What's more is that my audience retention spikes whenever Felix is on the screen. I know the people watching this channel aren't that interested with our exact bizarre ranking. I know is because you want to be Sherry's new mom. And it shouldn't be surprising. Felix is passionate, yet caring, strong, yet gentle. He's a loving father and an inspiring leader. He takes his duties as mayor seriously, but will never let his duties as mayor interfere with his duty to his family. Heck, his only flaw is that he's not good at cleaning or cooking. But is that even really a flaw? Could you really be happy living a life where your husbando did everything, leaving you completely superfluous or worse, useless. Of course not. Some people, lacking in wisdom, may dream of a life like that, but the wise know that a life without purpose, it, especially without purpose to one's loved ones, is not a life worth living. Basically, Felix's flaws just reinforce his position as the secretly top-tier husbando, pink diamond-tier no question. Okay, some question. Just two, really. Cooking and cleaning and all related work takes a lot of effort, especially for a house as large as Felix's. So does farming and taking care of animals. Would you really be able to spend your days picking peppers and milking your cows, and then spend your evenings cooking and cleaning and taking care of the house? For two? Or more? And even if you were able to do so, would you be able to do so at a level you'd be happy to present to your family instead of merely good enough, or worse, what I could do? Sherry's there to help now, but she will have to marry eventually. And for those wondering about how the royal trait applies to Felix, there's no indication that he pursued power. It instead seems to be something that people just decided on because he was good at leading. So chances are he does not have this royal trait. Chances are if he did, we probably would have heard about it because he has been married before. So it comes to this. One last gold tier chance that only Lloyd can take. When everything I've written is at stake To make the mark That only he can make Now that the reference that only I will get is out of the way, let's talk a little bit about Lloyd. At first, Lloyd doesn't even seem like Silvertear, except to those who feel kinship with a certain Crusader character. He's distant, rude, and standoffish. To make matters worse, unless there's a festival or a storm, he's gone every Wednesday, and all but the first two hours of every Tuesday. Not only do you need to put more effort into pursuing Lloyd, but he really doesn't seem to be worth the effort at first. Ah. Uh, but of course, there's more to the story than just that. Starting off, Lloyd is like a much more mature version of Kai from Friends of Mineral Town. Just saying that has already won him plenty of support for Gold Tier, but let's go a little deeper. Lloyd has lived much of his life as a vagabond. While he still travels for his work, he has set down roots in Zephyrtown. This tells us something important about Lloyd. He understands the importance of hearth and home as few can. Could any that have lived in Scotland their entire lives have known the ache of being so far from it? The very ache that inspired Dougie McLean to pin a song in praise of his beloved Caledonia? You will never find one more dedicated to hearth and home than one that has lived without hearth and home for much of their lives. 
The point is that Lloyd, likely more than any of the husbandos thus far, will be firmly dedicated to his hearth and home, to his family. And we can already see this in various different events and conversations. Lloyd certainly still loves his travels, but it's very clear that the primary goal of those travels is to benefit his home, whether it be his town, his friends, or his family. What's more is that he has the means to provide for said family. It's quite popular these days to say that, oh, money doesn't matter, but saying this is putting social praise for saying the right thing over what's good for your family, including your future children. Condemning your children and yourself to live in poverty is not a noble act. That doesn't mean that money is everything, just that it should not be dismissed as irrelevant. Besides that, a man of good character would not be content to condemn his future wife and children to poverty, and so would strive to break free of it himself. A man of good character may or may not be interested in fortune, but he is certainly interested in doing what he can to provide for his family, to give his family the most comfortable life they can have. Lloyd is a man of good character, which is why he has established himself as a successful merchant. But there's more. As you get to know him better, you come to realize just how much he cares about the people around him. He'll remind you, both through his own actions as well as his words, to always strive to be better tomorrow than you were today. He believes in your ability to do better every day, and doesn't want you to grow complacent. Another common piece of false wisdom is that you want a partner who treats you as perfect the way you are to encourage you to stagnate. The best part of a person, of humanity in general, is the desire to be better tomorrow than you were today. And how can a potential partner be a good one if they ignore the best part of you? How can they be said to love you? if they see you through a lens of perfection rather than who you are on the whole. Lloyd is not content to let you stagnate. He sees you as not only the person you are, but the person you can be. He's also not content to let himself stagnate, to engage in delusions of perfection. Moreover, he cares deeply for his community and, should he be your choice, his family. And that is why Lloyd gets the blue feather. Gold tear. Anyway, that was my husband overview for Grand Bazaar. It was a long one, but I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I didn't offend you too much, and I hope I gave you all some things to think about. Hope the rest of your night is a good one. Sleep well.